Before I begin my remarks, uh, I want to address something that right up front. And uh, I know, uh, you all know, that the fact of the matter is that women's right and women's health are under assault like we haven't seen in the last 50 years. And uh, we've seen state after state, including Georgia, passing extreme laws in clear violation of constitutional rights protected, including Roe v. Wade. And some have gone so far in states to deny even any exceptions uh, for uh, circumstances that would involve the right of a woman to choose. Delegate Tran. Yes, sir. How late in a pregnancy would your bill apply if a physician was simply willing to certify that, that the uh, continuation of the pregnancy would impair the mental health of, of the woman? How, how late are we talking about? In well, so, so the way the suggestion that we've um, made in the bill is to say it's in the third uh, trimester and at the you know, with the certification of the physician. No, no, I'm talking that. about your bill. How, how, yeah, how, late, I mean, how late in the third trimester could a, a physician perform an abortion if he indicated it would impair the mental health of the, of the woman? Or physical health. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm um, talking about the mental health. So, I mean, through the third trimester. The third trimester goes all the way up to 40 weeks. Okay. But to the end of the third trimester. Yep. I don't think we have a limit in the bill. So where it's obvious that a woman is about to give birth, she has physical signs of, of, that she is about to give a birth, would that still be a point at which she could request an abortion if she was so certified? So in this particular example, uh, if a mother is in labor, I can tell you exactly uh, what would happen. Um, the infant would be delivered. Uh, the infant would be kept comfortable. Uh, the infant would be resuscitated if, if that's what the uh, mother and the family desired. And then a discussion would ensue between the physicians and the mother. So, so I think this was really blown out of proportion. Uh, but again, we want the government not to be involved in these types of decisions. We want the decision to be made by uh, the, the mothers and their providers. And, and this is why Julie, that legislators, most of whom are men, by the way, shouldn't be telling a woman what she should and shouldn't be doing with her body. She's dilating. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that would be a, you know, a decision that the doctor, the physician, and the woman I would I understand make that. At that. I'm point. asking if your bill allows that. My bill would allow that, yes. The state of California took a landmark step toward criminal justice reform today as Governor Jerry Brown signed a bill that would eliminate cash bail for those awaiting trial. Marisa Lagos of public television station KQED has been covering this story, and she joins me now. Marisa Lagos, welcome. So just quickly, who was behind this effort, and what exactly would this new law do? Well, this is a change that was backed by the governor, the chief justice of the court system here, and a majority of the legislature, as well as some criminal justice groups. It would basically uh, eliminate cash bail as of October 2019 and replace it with a system that gives judges a lot more discretion. Uh, they would be guided by risk assessment tools that would decide whether someone's a low, medium, or high risk for release. Um, but ultimately, unless somebody was a misdemeanor defendant, in which case they would be automatically released least or very high risk or facing a violent felony, um, the judges would really ha make that call. Ramel Nellis, who's homeless, 
walked inside the Roslyn Savings Bank on Hempstead Turnpike Saturday afternoon and handed the teller a note demanding cash. The suspect then took off on foot and hasn't been seen since, but investigators say they know exactly who he is because he's done this before. According to police, Nellis was arrested just one month ago, back on January 8th, for allegedly robbing this very same bank and another bank in Valley Stream. But under the state's new bail law, he was released from jail. So again, this would apply in all criminal uh, accusation, criminal allegations? That's right. I mean, this is a huge sea change. We've seen some other changes in other states that do doesn't go this far. But basically, as of next fall, if you're arrested for a crime in California, uh, cash bail will not be on the table. It will entirely be up to that court. And there could be, of course, conditions, say an ankle monitor, probation oversight. Um, but the idea is that, you know, most low risk and medium risk defendants would get out and would be allowed to continue with their jobs and their families while they await trial. More pressure tonight to change New York's new criminal justice reform laws as one suspect is released without bail despite being accused of two unprovoked attacks on women. CBS2 political reporter Marsha Kramer says the man was freed even though he had not shown up in court for a previous assault. Eugene Webb, a 26-year-old homeless man, wasn't smiling when cops arrested him, charged with two separate unprovoked attacks on women within hours of each other, including this 23-year-old too terrified to show her face. The attack so violent, it knocked out a tooth. I got pushed from the side and then um, attacked again, and I was punched in the head. But Webb might have been smiling today. Because under the new criminal justice reform laws, he was released without bail, despite the fact that there was a warrant for his arrest for not showing up in court to face charges from a similar attack in September. People said that if we reduced incarceration and ended the era of mass incarceration, we would be endangered. It was the other way around, my friends. We now have Fewer people in our jails than any time since World War II. And we are safer for it and better for it. They will lose their license. Well, that's harsh. No. Harsh is having a nursing home resident who doesn't get the appropriate care. That's what's harsh. In the midst of the coronavirus crisis last month, New York's governor said the medical evidence showed where people were suffering and dying the most in the state. Vulnerable people in one place, it is the feeding frenzy for this virus. Despite those words, critics say one of the governor's executive orders ended up hurting rather than helping those most in need. That former directive asked nursing homes to take recovering COVID patients even if those patients had not first been tested to see if they were clear of the virus. Reality is it's too late. It's too late for my family. It's too late for too many families. CEO Mara Garcia King of Castle Hill, the Bronx, shared with us these photos of her 62-year-old father, Toribio who was transferred from a hospital to the Isabella Center in Washington Heights, where he died. COVID-19 related deaths there were close to 100. The purpose of sending him there was to protect him, and instead they infected him, they neglected him. Her father died alone, and right before he did, he put a desperate plea in writing. My father asked for help. He wrote that note to us. He wrote several notes to us asking for help. The nursing home has not discussed the case, citing patient confidentiality. The governor says nursing homes get their operating licenses yanked. If they cannot provide appropriate level of care, personal protective equipment for all staff, and proper isolation of patients discovered to be COVID-19 positive. California is granting early release to 3,500 inmates in an effort to reduce crowding and the spread of coronavirus. There'll be people serving terms for nonviolent crimes already due to be released within 60 days. Yeah, we're absolutely uh, trying to understand the, 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 some of the logic behind this. You know, we've had 27 uh, repeat offenders in the last 30 days, or sorry, 13 days uh, since this new emergency bail schedule was put in place and it's been uh we've had uh a gentleman that uh, was out about 37 minutes out of jail uh, that went, went on to commit two carjackings um, we have another person uh, that 
did about uh, two dozen uh, auto thefts and about nine burglaries, and we had to, had to let that person out as well. So it's, it's been a trying time for us. Frightening news tonight about a rape suspect released from jail because of the spread of COVID-19. Authorities say after being let out, he shot and killed his accuser. Tonight, this man, already charged with rape, now accused of murder, committed, police say, while he was on release from jail over concerns he could catch COVID there. The victim, Carla Dominguez, found shot to death July 29th, allegedly by the very man she earlier accused of raping her. In October, Ibrahim Buachi was jailed on the rape charge, which his lawyers denied to await trial, until April when his lawyers successfully argued for his release, partly on the grounds of the pandemic risks. Yes, they are released, and um, uh, the only uh, people that we're keeping in custody are people uh, for uh, serious violent crime, uh, people who... Uh, domestic violence, uh, child abuse, for some reason, does not qualify uh, to be kept in custody. So that's a, a zero bail offense. You're engaged in child abuse. That's the allegation, right? You're not convicted yet. You're telling me that if that right. officer goes into that home under child abuse, that person has zero bail and they're going to be able to go home that same day? Across the nation, releases are happening for prisoners nearing completion of their sentences and those seen to be low risk to their communities as jails and prisons continue to be major hotspots for COVID-19. That, that's correct. And uh, uh, other crimes like, like DUI uh, uh, would be kept in. Uh, but in this situation, we've seen a, a loophole here where child abusers uh, may be able to get out on the zero bail. Well, look, look. Uh, Repeat, repeat, repeat car thieves, too. You could steal a car every day uh, in California right now and uh, get out of jail every more, every uh, late in the afternoon, start in the morning, get out by the end of the afternoon. Should they be serving the time that they were ordered to serve despite the consequences that may arise? And do we start jeopardizing the public? In Political courage, there are moments in every person's career where you have to stand up and be willing to say, am I willing to sacrifice everything that I have, all the privileges that I have, so that the right thing can, can go through? This is one of those moments. This right now is one of those moments. So if you're an elected official that for any reason is on this call, I'm asking you to ask yourself, what are you willing to sacrifice to make sure that overfunded police departments are defunded. Well, but, but why is it necessary to take the money from the police? I mean, I understand your argument, the argument you're making about expanding social services, investing in social services, but the research does show that more police on the street means less crime. I'm proud of the protests, and um, uh, I think it's part of the tradition of New York. The violence is bad, reprehensible, should be condemned, but it is not the overwhelming picture in New York. Destroying property which can be replaced is not violence. Too many see the protests as the problem. Please, show me where it says that protests are supposed to be polite and peaceful. And this is the same thing going on all over the country in cities led by Democrats. You had 76 people shot in Chicago, 14 dead, 28 shot in Atlanta, four dead, 20 shot in Cleveland, three dead. Every one of these cities are led by Democrats. They're villainizing the police. They're victimizing the thugs. And this is what happens when you do that. How was last night? Scary. They went straight to Office Max, the dollar store, and every store over here that I go to, I have nowhere to go now. I have no way to get there because the buses aren't running. The same people who deny this reality deny a lot of far uglier facts. Rising murder rates, shootings, looting, property destruction, attacks on the elderly, killings by released felons. Attacks on free speech, riots described as peaceful protests. And remember how the media pretended that defunding the police was a reasonable ask? For this to succeed, they had to bury reality, like Gallup's survey showing that over 80% of blacks and Hispanics want the same amount or more police. So I'm here in Harlem on Malcolm X Boulevard to ask the people, is this true? What do you think of the people who say, oh, your community will be better off if there was no police. I think they're full of crap. I think they're, they're being somewhat dangerous. How dangerous do you think it would make this neighborhood if that was the case? Very dangerous, because it would be crazy. 
people will be just going crazy. You know what I mean? It'd be worse than what it is. Robbery, looting, raping, murder. You know? I think there was a movie like that. I think it was called The Purge. What would you think would happen in this community if they looked to abolish the police? It'd be havoc. Abolishing the NYPD, that'd be suicide. But yes, they're needed. I, uh, I put for them to be here. There's too many criminals out here, man. Are you kidding me? I wouldn't feel safe. No, we need control of the city. So I think the, the police, the police are necessary. We need them here. We need them. But you need the police to police the land, man, and the people, you know? I have family members that are police. I respect the police. I would not want to see a lawless uh, society. Because my son, he's eight now. He wants to be a police. I want to push him to be a police. Would you say the relationship between the community and NYPD are pretty good? Bad? I would say uh, it's pretty good. You know, all so police good. officers are not bad. You know, you got some of them that really care about the people and really want to help the people. And I think they're invested in the community. Funny how the white anchors never bring that stuff up. Much better off with the black community be if we dismantled the police? Uh, I, I think infinitely, honestly. How much better off would the, would the black community be if we separated the police from them? How much better off would we all be? I'd rather have something that doesn't work without them than what we currently have, which is something that doesn't work with them. Policing in this country is about keeping black people down. They're, they're monsters. I hate the police. Police arose out of slave catching patrols. The police are an occupying army. Like, I just hate the police and everything that they stand for. How do people you think feel like in East Harlem about the NYPD? I probably the same way I feel about them, you know? I, I probably worse. But in order for a left-wing view of the world to exist, you must pretend none of that other bad stuff exists, meaning the consequences of left-wing action and Democratic leader inaction. You can thank a media and the left working together to preserve their power. So that's what's happening in America right now. We didn't play all of the tape we have. There's a lot of it. Some of the tape is too shocking, and honestly, it's too incendiary. We understand that television is an emotional medium. And we don't want to make things worse. We're not going to. But you get the point. The point is, this is a national emergency. It's a profound national emergency. Uh, we take an oath to protect and defend the American people. Their safety is our top priority.